The warmest of greetings to you and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching. This is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in a knowledge-rich curriculum using the best teaching method known to science, storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen to empower your children. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Bex. I have got experience teaching across the primary school range, and I also have the privilege of training the next generation of teachers as well. Hi, I'm Nicola, and I have similar experience to Bex working throughout primary school age, and now actually into secondary, and also I've trained teachers in my career too. And today we are exploring what history we can teach with an incredibly true wartime tale. You can listen to the story by downloading our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for Herbert's War. There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you're an epic educator, as of November 2022, you'll also get the story as a paperback, gorgeously illustrated by Ellie Booth Bentley, which should be with you just in time for Armistice Day. Don't worry if you missed that, though, as you can also order the book from any bookshop, including Amazon, and Epic Educators can access the ebook and full audiobook through the Epic Tales app. Right now, though, let's pick up our discussion with Bex Nicola and Corporal Herbert Bauer, and we're anticipating quite an extensive discussion on this one because, of course, it is a history episode, and we are releasing this story around about the same time as Armistice Day, and that's pretty much why I ended up telling the story myself, actually, was because I got asked to go into a school and share stories with them around Armistice Day, and because I knew about the story of Jane's grandfather from helping her on her show, it, it instantly came to mind. And it's such a beautiful one for bringing people into that era, but not really focusing on the warfare and the, the sort of the horror of the war. I mean, that's obviously a big part of the story, but it also allows you to really see what's going on. All of the different people involved. Herbert goes to the other side. So you've got the chance to really explore the German side of the trenches as well. So, yeah, there's probably going to be loads that we can look out here. And sh shall we start with ages four to seven, Bex? Sure. Like you're saying, their history link has probably run through all of our other discussions as yes, well. Yes, yeah, it has, yeah. But specific history skills, because I think you can end up lumping history and geography together, but actually mm. it's really, really important that we teach children what is the skill of a historian and what is the skill of a geographer. Like yes. right from our early years, children, that understanding of chronology. So I think that's where I'd probably start, like placing the war within the context of history. So I'd make a timeline, make it really, really visual for the children, having a, like, a bit of masking tape or something on the floor and putting on pictures of things that we know that have happened. So obviously we can go all the way from Queen Elizabeth's recent death to when she was crowned to her being a princess and work back mm. who was on the throne because like our smallest children often yesterday is a really really long time ago but <laughs> like when they come back in and you're like oh what did you do? like the parents what did you do at school I don't know and that was like five hours yeah. ago so I think that understanding of how things change and how things move on so I build a timeline so they can really understand when this happened and obviously, mm. we've had lots of recent celebrations to do with our Queen, the Jubilee. And that was like that 75 years. And actually, we're talking further in the past than that. And like mm. the recent past and then the past that's further away from in their minds. So I think start with that chronology so they can actually get an understanding in their heads of how long ago we're talking. And then what I'd really, really want to explore with the children is what life was like in World War One. So thinking about mm -hmm. what life was like back home. So thinking about how people lived at that time, like school. What was school like? Did everybody go to school? Was it only a few people that went to school? What did children yeah. do when it was wartime? Because they actually often helped. Mm -hmm. They would knit things for people on the front line. Obviously, their dads would often be away. So what was that like? What was it like to be the people back home? And then what was it like to be the people in the trenches as well? So what was life like as a soldier in World War One? So looking at the bits of the story of Herbert that we can really unpick for the children. And like you said, Chip, I probably wouldn't go into too much of the horror of war with the children, but not hide it from them either. If they had questions, mm. 
I'd look to answer it um, honestly and sensitively, depending on the age group that I was working with. And like I said, in the English week, I'd really want to make some trenches for the children to use small world figures in. So build some Mm. in my tough trays and make some trenches so the children can have a little bit of an understanding of how narrow they were. And there's some great Mm. video clips that I probably would show to younger children just of historians getting into the trenches and I can put those in the resources section Mm. and there's a really really great BBC Bite Size website as well where you can actually see what a trench was like and look at what different people were doing I would also want to look at how they were looked after so how you were looked after at home and then how you were looked after in the war so linking to the hospital Mm. so actually what life is like in a hospital, what kind of resources they would have, the medicine that they would have, the access they'd have to that medicine when you're at home and then when you were at war as well. Would you also start using some of the language of historians as well, like sources, or is that too... I think I've said it before, like uh, there's all that research into actually if children can say Tyrannosaurus Rex and understand what that means, then yeah. actually we shouldn't just be saying, oh, you're too young to understand this. Because if you say a source, which is a piece of evidence that can tell us about the war then i think they would understand it so i always email out my parents and say that we're studying world war one have you got anything have you got anything in your family that we could look at that we could actually physically touch and see and that's great because then you can add in words like artifact or memorabilia yeah Recently, as I said, we're doing World War One, and my LSA, she's got one of the tins from the Christmas of 1914, where they were sent wow. the presents to the trenches, and it was wow. a tin with chocolate and biscuits and cigarettes <laughs> for everybody, so the children have seen that, and they just think it's the most fascinating, and that's year sixes, so I'm sure that our younger learners would like to see that as well. And that reminds me that I I would love to look at Christmas in the trenches. And there's that Mm. wonderful Sainsbury's advert Mm. that looks at Christmas in the trenches. I don't know if you've seen it. But um, no. if you haven't, it's it was the same to be Christmas advert. Just oh, what, a, what from last year? No, it's it was a number of years ago. But I'll put it in the resources. But it's amazing. It just shows them what happened in the famous football match of 1914. Uh, yeah, where Germany won, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's just lovely to see the the two sides meeting, and I guess that would then link into the fact that actually in our story the German soldiers were the rescuers. Mm. And you can say to the children, actually, sometimes they didn't want to fight each other, but they had to because you had to sign up if you were well to go and fight. So that Christmas advert's amazing. And I think even our young children could understand that. I bet it will be available on YouTube. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, I use it every... I have looked at it with my year twos before and they really, really like it. So I think, Mm. what was it like to have Christmas in the war? Because they all thought it was going to be over by Christmas. Yes, yeah. It's a shame we don't have any stories about, like, Christmas 1915 or 1916. It always comes back to the football match of 1914. And I would love to know whether they they started doing that every year, whether it became an annual thing. I think they did the truce until New Year. There's another book that I'll put in the resources section called Archie's War that could be used throughout the age ranges. Hmm. It's kind of a scrapbook of a child at home receiving things from the war and you could again link that in because it talks about nurse Edith Cavell and you could talk about nurses when you're talking about people who are being looked after so you can bring in a significant person there's so many ideas for history so (laughs) lots and lots and lots I'm going to pause there and let Nicola talk (laughs) for a little bit because otherwise I'll just carry on as we we hear the word significant person we'll bring Nicola into the conversation (laughs) and start exploring what history links there are for ages 7 to 11 and well this is a key stage 2 topic isn't Mm. it Nicola as Bex has already mentioned so yeah take the floor Bex feel free to interrupt Because if if you're teaching year six and doing it at the moment, then feel free to add any ideas. I think the idea of sources is really important. It's a period of history where we've actually got evidence, you know, primary source information to be able to share with children. You could discuss the difference between primary and secondary sources, which sources are more reliable. What bias is there? I mean, if it's possible to find a source from both sides and discuss, Mm. you know, what different perspectives people would have. I think propaganda is more linked to World War Two, so I probably won't mention that. But um, certainly using sources, newspapers and poetry, obviously, we haven't mentioned that. We didn't mention that in English either, but there's some no, wonderful English. World War One mm. poetry that 
could easily be explored, you know, Wilfred Owen and many others. Well, that, that kind of links into the propaganda question, doesn't it? Because mm. with Siegfried Sassoon especially, you can see the way he was sort of enlisted to help with the propaganda at the first parts of the war. But then he very much changed his attitude, didn't he, towards the end? Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Mm. I mean, talking of sources, when you, you research Corporal Herbert Bauer a bit more, it actually says that where he lives is mentioned in the 1901 census. So you could almost bring that up and start using that. He was living at 31 Bristol Street in Leeds. And then <laughs> finding out almost so what can we learn about him? And then also what can we learn about the war in general as well? I mean, other yeah. things like he was in, you know, the Battle of Arras was the one, I think that's how you say it, in 1917, the battle that he was wounded in. Mm. There's quite a lot of information again on that battle and that could be another way you know what do we know about that battle he was actually there what facts do we, can we find out Gosh, so you can really go into historical case study almost definitely and using those sources and then I was going to say bringing that together and I know it links to English but in history we often do writing as well and writing a newspaper article would show bringing all that information together you could interview him as part of the article and also perhaps interview some of the other people in the story we haven't mentioned recently you know, the Russian soldier that helped him mm. interview him in the newspaper report, but bring in factual information. So they're learning the facts through history, but then obviously putting it together through English, but showing their historical knowledge through the English and the yes. sorts of language that they would use. Well, the language is a key one, isn't it? Because when they finally get into secondary school, the sorts of words that they'll be expected to use in history might be quite different to the sorts of words they're expected to use in English. So being able to think in these different language sets, we've already talked about the mathematical language and yeah being able to talk in historical languages well not historical language that's, that's a different thing altogether isn't it but the language <laughs> of uh, historians is very important definitely and actually you could almost take that language that you want the children to use and put it on a little word list in front of them for when they're writing mm. to ensure they're using it and check they're using it in the right context as well Another idea was to think about World War One in the local area. So obviously mm. this time of year, we're all thinking, I've got Remembrance Day coming up, finding out about the local heroes that either gave their life or went to battle or the local heroes in the local area that kept the community going during those times and maybe putting a remembrance service together, remembering some of those people so it actually becomes for a purpose. Oh, that'd be really lovely. I mean, yeah. that's something you could do as a whole school, isn't it? Definitely. Each class could take a different aspect or a different person. We had um, a local book written about the people who sacrificed their lives in World War II from our local area. And then we got the children to learn about those people and then put something together to remember them. It was really powerful. Wow. And actually some of the children had the same surnames and they realised it was their relatives. It was amazing. Gosh. But um, yeah. That's been beautiful. I can see Bex nodding away with that one. I think that's going to be uh, next on your school's agenda. Yeah, I'm not saying that. <laughs> and I have to say the only other two things that our children have been really interested in the world or one is the use mm -hmm. of animals at war of course yeah so yeah. they've been absolutely fascinated like by the ratter dogs and there's a dog called sergeant stubby who actually got a medal so mm -hmm. if you're interested in animals at war research <laughs> sergeant stubby and then they also were really fascinated by the fact that women couldn't fight in world war one and what they yeah. did do yeah um, and even i know that it was in the second world war but the fact that the queen was a car mechanic mm. in the war because she wanted to do something and actually looking at the role of women and all the things that they did because men were at war and then the fact that that raised their profile and meant that they were thinking, oh, I might want to do more than just stay at home mm. and look after my family. And we actually wrote a persuasive letter to the British Army to say why they felt that women should be allowed to sign up, which is amazing. Interesting. Yeah, that, that is amazing. And, and very brave of them as well. You could also think about how war has changed, how modern yes. day war is different to war in World War One, and the developments that have happened during mm. that time as well, whether it's technical or from the material aspects. You mentioned about material of uniforms. You know, in those days it was wool and leather, whereas nowadays it's more plastic based materials. So it's sort mm. of thinking from a history point of view about how things have changed over time. Yeah. Gosh, there's so much fascinating stuff again. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. But probably one of the biggest things to come out of this discussion for me is the fact, Nicola, that you have managed to find so much about Herbert Bauer 
online because I, I don't even think that Jane knows this. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm going to let Jane know that you have found all of this stuff. Um, and, and it if, wasn't if you, hard to do either. It really wasn't. Children could easily have a go at doing that themselves. Well, that makes it even better then for yep. others listening to this podcast. But yeah, please do send some of those um, resources, yep, some of those links so that we can definitely add it to packs for our epic educators. But yeah, I'm going to share it with Jane as well because I, I expect she's going to love that. It's just, it's always magical isn't it when you look into the past and you see like you said to those children seeing their own names on those memorials it's just magical yeah definitely that's all we have time for in this episode folks if you'd like to talk to us about anything you've heard in this podcast or if there's a subject you are soon to teach that you'd like us to cover you can find us on social media using at teach happily or leave us a review using your favorite podcast app Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world so children everywhere can enjoy knowledge-rich learning in a way that's effective, memorable and enjoyable all at the same time. Tomorrow, Corporal Herbert Bauer will help us teach religious education. But right now, it only remains for me to say cheerio and we hope to hear your story soon. So... Cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon.